co-founder of WTA Architecture and Design Studios. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, I finally got to speak here at Anthology um, after four years, I guess. And today I'm glad to kind of like share with you guys what we do as an office and, you know, our agendas. Well, also partly why we do Anthology and all that. Um, so, our office is, we kind of like grasp into this agenda called social architecture right now. And what we're trying to push is we're trying to use architecture um, to build better communities. And, well, you see here are four cats. That's basically the guys in our studio. Um, they basically represent studio culture for us because they're there 24-7, and that's what studio is about. Um, social architecture, this kind of came about um, a lot due to being in Manila and you know the context of Philippine architecture and what we do. Um, something we noticed is that the Philippines, uh, being an archipelagic nation, uh, were quite fragmented and we have very tribal societies and so I think we're used to putting up barriers for security, for safety, for privacy. We're very private people and so our architecture has been geared towards connecting everyone. And so instead of like um, building to follow the context, what we're trying to do is we want to change things. Uh, we want to bring people together, um, we want to open up barriers, and we also want to explore what architecture could be without walls. And so, it's an architecture of um, deletion, if anything. So, this is the context, basically, of what we find. Um, we find Manila. Manila is an um, interesting city um, where we have the streetscape as the primary public space. And so, everything happens on the streets, and that's basically what we face every day. And this is um, where I grew up, that house there. And so if you can see, well, this is what it is right now. Everything is extended out towards the street. So the street is basically your own space. You're basically almost using the street. Um, and then I also remember playing street on the, playing basketball on the streets. So that's kind of like how we live in Manila. Um, our public space is the immediate front of our house. And in a way, that's what architecture has meant for us in that you know, our vision of architecture extends only so far as our backyard. We don't see as a whole, uh, we don't look at our cities or our country even, um, growing with architecture and developing it forward, but rather we just see the building and its immediate surrounding. And that's it for us. That's as far as we are concerned. And so one of the things that we want to change is we want to kind of identify why we have to see beyond the borders or boundaries that we have um, artificially put together. For example, this is Metro Manila. And right now, I think there's like 16 cities and one municipality. So it's a hodgepodge of different things. There's not one consistent agenda. No one's pushing you know, one overarching goal or vision for everything. And that being said, everyone's actually competing against each other. So we feel like one of the things that architecture can do is you know, to bring things together. And so that's what we're trying to do with our architecture. Um, so if you look at this map of Manila, one of the things that we noticed is the growth of Manila is centered here, actually, downtown Manila. Well, the Chaburos is ground zero. The story of the Philippines, or at least Manila, is the story of the old, you know, um, Tagalog city of Manila, and then Tondo, and Binondo, which grew between these two places. So I think everything is actually centered here. And if you look at the urban development of Manila, the growth is actually equidistant from the center. So that's why some parts of Quezon City are not as developed as, say, Makati, because they're actually correlated with maybe Paranaque or Makitupa. So the distance between Manila kind of determines the growth. But what's happening right now is since Manila was kind of left alone for the longest time, growth has been growing along the fourth corridor, the, the fourth circumferential road, which is EDSA. And so now you see all the you know, traffic chaos in EDSA. And we're building C5 and eventually going to build C6. And so everything is going outwards. But if you think about it, unless we build up our center, you know, we're just going to keep destroying the center and moving out and moving out. And that's just going to add more to our problems. So what we feel like is we want to center um, our developments in Manila. Uh, we want to push for this city um, to be kind of like a rich core 
you know, and I think also uh, that serves to give us um, a richer identity as architects. So our design process, um, basically what we do as a firm, is we try to come up with a rational design process. Uh, when we do architecture, we feel like, you know, we always say that like, architecture can be subjective. That good architecture, you know, people, you know, it depends on our taste, but we feel like it doesn't. That architecture must have this kind of like good rational uh, decision-making process behind it. And so it's a process-based uh, practice. And whatever the design is, whatever the end product may be, as long as there's a rational explanation of why things are and the intent is showing, then we feel like that can be considered good architecture. And so these are just some projects that we'll talk in later. Um, this is a library, a proposal, actually, just a proposal for UP, um, to like how we look at their library, how it could be. And another one is actually an office building, which is an old, on a church that, was, that used to be, on a site that used to be an old church. And so we just tried to kind of like relay how the arches and then how we can have this memory of the past be retained, even after we built vertically on the site. Um, another way we do things, uh, we basically do programmatic deconstructivism. So we like to look at our typologies and our different building types, and we try to deconstruct them. Uh, we try to ask, what are the origins and why things are how they are? Um, what, what is a library? What makes a library? What is a shopping mall? And what is a museum even? And so our answers have kind of like, I think if you break things down apart, and then you try to put them together again using the context and the program that we have right now, you can come up with new things. So it's basically like um, trying to find the origins of different um, typologies also. So these projects, for example, it's like, um, it's a library, it's a, for a design competition in Varna. And what we found here is we wanted the library to be more open, uh, to be somewhere that you can pass through, um, where you have different size spaces that would accommodate uh, different people. Uh, you can visit the library on your own, you know, as a group, um, as a couple maybe. You can be leisurely walking by. You can be going there for research. But the important thing is there must be spaces that accommodate uh, variants of uh, uses. And the other one is our project here in, in Chamuros. Um, that's the Museo del Prado. And for this is we wanted to identify what makes a museum. And how can we make a museum more inclusive or open to everyone. And so that's we can talk about later. Um, another thing we want to talk about is, in our projects, um, we always think about function versus form, but we would rather figure out purpose as the primary objective. Because I think good architecture must show its intent. And you know, if we focus on the purpose that the spaces are built for, and what they should be doing, um, I think we can come up with better, you know, uh, more adaptable architecture and also an architecture that would fit the time and place where we are at. <laughs> so these are two projects. Um, one is the Bookstop project, which is now, I think, NCCD. And the other is a lifestyle mall, actually, which we'll discuss later. Um, um, so the first idea that we actually went through was called human scale. I mean, I think we're all familiar with building things to scale. And so we've been exploring this with the house that we're doing in Alabang West. It's a relatively new subdivision, quite empty. And if you look at the typical subdivision layout, um, I mean, this is a very prototypical one, and that's why we kind of like tried to uh, work on it. The size is very typical. It's about 300 square meters. Um, the location is a new, it's a very typical upper class suburban space. And the it's built for a family, a very typical Filipino family of four. It's very nuclear. And so we got like the typical houses that you would see on the side. And so we thought, you know, one of the challenges of building a house is the conundrum between do you want private space or open space? You want to have nice views of outside, but you don't want people to be looking in. You want to have your own private rooms, but you also want to be together as a family. So that's the thing that we can latch on. And one of the things that we noticed about the narrative is that um, we try to design our houses with a, with a front, right, with a front porch and all that. Um, but most of us, when we come home, we actually arrive by uh, cars. And we come down the car, and so what we decided to do is we wanted to extend, you know, um, this garden to the basement. And so if you look at the left part 
of the basement that extends all the way up. And so that's where you have like an indoor garden, which is not on the ground space, but actually on the basement. Um, because we feel like, well, we feel like every day when you go home, you need some sort of like biophilic attachment. At least, even if you go straight to your office to work or anything, which the owner does, um, you see some sort of greens every day. You, know, you have a relationship with nature. And when you look at the typical space, the dining space, um, it, oh, there's a double volume space that extends to the family room. And we kind of use the family room as the center space for the house, which connects the bedroom. So from the, from the family room, you can see the bedroom, you can see the study, um, you can see the studio office. So everyone's connected in this space and it becomes the center space for the house rather than the living room or the, or the bedrooms. And what you actually have here is the four walls are actually the double walls on the exterior because we wanted to have open windows inside. Um, so there's this like small space where we inserted a, kind of like a vertical garden. And so when you look out, at least you can have your open windows, the wind can come in through the sides, um, but still have that privacy, you know, that exterior fence. So we made away with the fencing actually, so it's an open house. And this is how it looks like. Um, the scale is pretty small. Um, I think it fits just a family of four. And this is a project we're kind of excited to finish soon. Another project that we like to talk about, we always like to talk about the value of architecture, how architecture can show change, how we can make change happen, and yet how also we can show why things should be how they are as they are. For example, like bringing anthology here to Chaburos, uh, we wanted everyone to remember Fort Santiago, not and be here for like you know a weekend and spend time here instead of just being here on a field trip on a bus. And so we thought about Escolta and the Santa Cruz area where we built a project, and it's called Chateau Lorraine. Um, it's a very commercial project. It's a condo. It's a condominium building. And what we thought was, if you look at the old buildings here they seem to not know what to do with them. So they're being repurposed for to be warehouses. Um, some of them are selling um, rice or whatever. And the upper floors are all empty. And then, well, you see the old Manila Opera House being turned into a uh, quick hotel. And then, or you see them being torn down and being built into new condominium buildings. And one of the things that caught my fancy was when we were, when you travel, and you go around seeing the old cities around the world, um, you seem to think that everything you know is preserved. But a lot of the new buildings are actually new. It's just that they build them to support you know the existing heritage sites. So as a practice also, we wanted to kind of like figure out if we can do this. And so we tried our hand when we were doing this um, project there, and we figured out if we can make a condominium project work at this day and age, then maybe this can be pursued by future developers and it can be something wherein they don't tear down the existing fabric but rather support it you know, with what they build and so the, the communities or the neighborhoods become richer and so with this project we really try to identify the various um, kind of like detailing that we see around uh, well, the Avenida area and Santa Cruz and from memory of what we feel like walking around the space should be the arcade and walks and all that and this is how the building looks like. Um, it's a 22-story building. And the space is work because I think it belongs to the area. And one of the nice things is that I think if you pass through there, it might feel like it's always been there, which is what we have always wanted this project to do, is to kind of like say to the new developments that's coming up in the area that you know we can preserve the look and feel of our neighborhoods. Another thing that we like to talk about is like social spaces. Um, in our country, a lot of our social spaces are actually private. <laughs> we go to the mall on the weekends. Uh, we always, you know, we we don't go outdoors as much as we should. I think whether it's for lack of available public space or whether we're just not used to being outdoors, um, that's something that we should try to change with architecture and so also like try to, uh, you know. Um, convince our clients in how they can create more public spaces. And so this is a project that we did for Avoid This Land. Um, it's called The Outlets in Lipa. Um, the site is 
Well, it's nearest to, the, to Lipa. And this is the old town of Lipa. And Lipa is any typical uh, Filipino city. It has small streets leading out to like piazzas in front of a church, in front of the maybe the bigger buildings, which is the government center and all that. And so this is our site. Um, but it's actually located between Lipa and Guadalajara. So it has a dichotomy. There's actually two influences between the city of Lipa and the newer city of Montgomery, or the smaller city of Montgomery. And one of the things that I've always been interested in is I've been interested in how we repurpose alleys. And if you look at these four photos, they're alleys from different continents. And always the idea is if you provide space, like an alley, people kind of use it, utilize it for their own uses. And it becomes a more adaptive and a livelier space because of that. And We've also been interested in plazas. So here you have the main plaza, uh, Plaza um, Independencia in Liba, one that's closer to Manila, um, Plaza Mirando, and the plaza in Aviapenza in Venice. So the idea of like, this open space being something that's very relevant to a human being. Um, it's not just something that's Filipino or anything, but it's something that I think everyone um, kind of enjoys. So we try to incorporate this. And the idea really for the project is for it to become kind of like a community center, um, something for that you know the people in the area to enjoy and eventually to merge or blend into the surrounding community. And so to do this, we kind of like had different speeds, you know, uh, multi-speed zoning for the different pathways. And we wanted to create this variance, you know, this um, urban variance in terms of how you experience the development. So if you look at, there's actually two zones. Um, the left part is a more leisurely walk where you actually can you know, shop and buy and explore. It's a more experiential part of the development. And the right side is more like a shopping, you know, it's a destination shopping thing. You go there, you walk around, you shop, you buy things. And if you look at the section, um, it's a one-story affair. Um, it's trying to jumpstart development and improve uh, build, uh, the community. And the whole thing is basically filled with these like, solar panels on the roof there. And this is how it's it's gonna look like. Well, this is how it, the perspectives are. Um, it's a very suburban context, but it's a suburban context that fills up a space that doesn't that doesn't empty spaces. And it's a short video of the space. The development uh, opened last November. The football pitch here um, is the largest in the zone, probably one of the it's, it's a tournament size pitch, a FIFA size pitch. And so there's a center for sport activity. Um, it's a very light retail development, but you can see the urbanity of the streetscape. You have very it's very porous, it's open on all sides. Um, there's no main entrance, you can enter anywhere. The architecture is pretty simple. Um, it's really more about the landscape and the planning. The landscape will grow into its place. Um, everything is young. The shops will fully open around maybe June or July of this year. If you look at the spaces, there's a there's different kinds of spaces. There was a small piazza. This is a big garden or a picnic ground. And you can see that the variation in slope where you have two stories and one is very gentle. So it's a wandering type of space, you know, you wander down, you don't go down to the space. Well, you can bike around. And this is the main prominence, so you can see that's the difference of the width of the pattern. We try to make it, the architecture, not the main part of it, so it's a simple skin, it's a simple mix of like, just wood panels and white. And really, it's almost like using this budget instead of building a building um, or trying to build like a small city scheme. Almost. And so this is another size space. Um, it's kind of like a small backyard garden. Um, the entry to the pitch, um, which we hope will be used uh, more and more, not just as a football pitch, but also like a, a good outdoor space where you can enjoy yourself.
and the amazing part is you can actually see birds flying around the space. You can actually, you know, because it's just so porous that it's open on all sides that it's almost better integrated into this nine hectare site. And it's in an industrial park. So that's, you know, you're giving this industrial complex you know, a much, much more lifestyle feel. And that's the main promenade. Um, it's something like the Ramblas in Barcelona that we're trying to create. It actually leads from the front or the, the, the front all the way back to the football pitch. That's the outlets. Another topic we talk about in our office is we're trying to, you know, we see Metro Manila as this amazing uh, laboratory for architecture. Uh, we're one of the biggest mega cities in the world, and so the urbanity and density that you actually see here is not something you could probably find anywhere else. And so what we're saying is, for architects, it's such a, you know, rich opportunity for us to explore and to figure out how we can, you know, uh, design you know, our futures. Um, how we can find, you know, our own language, our own architecture, and how we can share this with the rest, you know, uh, the rest of the world, and be part of this like global discussion in architecture. And so, one of the projects that we're doing, um, this is called uh, Twelve Luxury Flats. It's in San Juan. If you look at San Juan right now, what's happening there is people are building up these uh, small townhouse developments, and they're all walled off from each other. And well, people like living in them. The unfortunate part is if you keep doing this, what happens is you have empty streets. You have empty streets uh, with these developments that are detached from the, from the urban realm. Um, they're detached from each other. Nobody knows what's going on inside. Um, if anything unfortunate happens, then you're on your own. And this does not make for a healthy community. So we said, how do we change this? Um, how do we affect change here? How do we you know, create an alternative to this? The thing is, people want to live in their, you know, in a good space with privacy, with security. Um, they don't want the high density living we find in our typical um, condo developments. Right? So we figured it might be a matter of like, so this is how San Juan is, the black spots. They're kind of like eating up the entirety of Little Baguio. So if you imagine, you know, it progresses further, then you end up with empty streets all over. And just for you to be able to buy, I don't know, um, something from your corner store, you have to take a ride in your car and drive to the supermarket or somewhere. Which I think destroys the fabric of San Juan, which is an old city, and supposedly has very walkable streets. And so we said, you know, instead of like having 12, you know, different houses, um, can we just stack them up together? So if we stack them and have one unit per floor, what you have there is you have better privacy than a townhouse, um, since you have no neighbors. Um, you have nicer views. Uh, you have better ventilation. Um, you have better security, obviously. And then you're able to have a smaller footprint still and locate in a much better location, um, in a much more connected space. And your ground floor development can have a few shops, and so if everything turns out like this, it could be kind of like a very medium density kind of living. But the density basically is the same as a townhouse. And so this is what we have come up with. Like, it's a very typical housing unit. But the space is enough. Um, it's enough for three or four bedrooms. And you have a view on all sides. And your relationship with you know, the outdoors, I think, is much more evident. Because you're not bunched up against a neighbor. You don't open your window to see the next house. Um, you know, people don't hear when you're, I don't know, arguing or fighting. And so there's much more separation. Um, it's going to finish sometime in the middle of the year also. This is how it currently looks like. Um, each floor is slightly unique. Um, the, the balconies actually twist, so, some of, so they're not all, no floors are identical. These are the perspective views of it. And this is how it's actually looking like. Right? So each of those floors are one unit. They're all separate units. <laughs> we we try to 
well, one of the things we try to prove also is we want to prove that you know we can actually make our buildings white, and we actually enjoy building it white. And I think white is an enjoyable color, but a lot of clients, you know, they try to push back against that. So as much as we can, um, we try to you know put that in. Uh, well, so that's a, that's the sky. That's the reflect. But almost like if you look at it, like if you when you wake up, you see the sky, and actually the views from the interior, you can see all the way to Manila. Uh, you can see the Sherabad, Sherabad there. I think you can see the mountains. Um, so the spaces are amazing. Um, it's very open. <clears throat> the verandas act as a backyard. So we don't have a multitude of small balconies, rather we wanted uh, we want a whole balcony where you can actually have a good outdoor space in an upper floor. So we figured out this would be, you know, uh, an enjoyable alternative to a typical housing development there in San Juan. And I think it works this way. It's quite successful. Each unit is priced about the same as a typical townhouse, but you know, you just have a different lifestyle, a more urban oriented lifestyle. And the bedrooms are big. This is, uh, I think, one of the bedrooms are. And all around, you have you have a gas station, you have a supermarket, you have a restaurant there, you have like at least 20 or 30 dining outlets. And it's a more quiet space. Um, you're, you, you don't have any neighbors. You, when the elevators open, you're home. Um, so doing this, uh, our, we did another project in Binondo. Um, it's in Ongpin Street, which is the center of Binondo. Um, Chinatown is centered ar around this street. We always refer to Chinatown as Ongpin. And you know, one of the things that you know you take, you know, you, ima you immediately imagine when you say Chinatown is this like huge um, <laughs> urbanity or density, which is typical of Hong Kong even. And so we thought, you know, there's really no open space. There's no available space right now in Ongpin, especially this main road. But across, right across, or at least in the center of uh, Chinatown, you have been on the church. And though it's not a green wall, but you actually have, have this like vertical, well, ivy covered wall. And probably for most of the residents in Ongpin, that's the only greenery that they experience every day. And so what he said was, we, if we, every building we build in Nondo, we wanted to cover the with vertical greens. I think putting up vertical greens as something that's to beautify a place might not be something we're pursuing. But as but as an alternative you know, to the lack of open spaces, I think you know for that lifestyle, I think it could increase the livability of a space. And same as the previous project, I think we learned from that. And each unit is about 300 square meters. Again. So. It's not the typical Binondo building where everyone is cramped or packed tightly together. You have enough space actually to live a good life. And you have two units per floor, but the elevators are totally independent. So when the elevator opens again, it's just you. Um, this is what the building is looking like. And so we're trying to create uh, you know, vertical greens, but vertical greens that are accessible. So actually, if you go to the balconies, uh, which are which would function the same as the luxury flats, you can actually see the vertical bridge right across. So every day you can have this visual connection, this way of feeling connection to nature. Um, another project or another idea that we like to think about is context. And so one of the projects we're building in Nakapagal, in Bay City, um, it's near the new bus terminal, if anyone's been there. Um, and also it's going to be near the future LRT station. So one of the things that we thought was, you know, as we build this up, 
uh, it's going to be a very um, commercial and um, commuting space. Like we want it to be more pedestrian. Uh, we wanted to have people be walk around our space also. So what we did was we opened up the ground space. Um, so basically, if you look at the office building on the left, the entire ground floor is open. Um, so it's making the office lobby open to everyone. And if you look at to the left, um, those are shops. And then basically the, the middle part is acting as an office lobby. And each unit again. Um, so we wanted, we kind of like wanted our housing projects to be livable. So every unit has three sides of windows. Um, so if you look at the average density um, in that area, this is probably like about one third of our other projects in the area. So instead of like having 800 units in the project or in the typical size lot, we have about, I think, 200. And this is how it looks like. That garden in the middle actually connects Ishudi uh, with the office, the promenade and the ground floor. So if you walk all the way to the end and you look across, you actually see the people um, entering through the office promenade. Um, another project we're doing in the Bay City area. Um, so in this plot, we actually are doing three projects. Um, two of them are very high density residential projects. So we've had this opportunity to uh, build a hotel project in front. And what we wanted to do, since we're building two buildings actually, we wanted to have this kind of like dialogue between the two buildings. And so they're actually kind of like reacting with each other. So it's almost dancing together. Um, but not just that, we wanted it to be visually connected to people who pass by. So we actually managed to convince the developer to open up the ground level so we can pass through. So we've created a pedestrian road inside um, one of the densest um, the cities or neighborhoods in Manila. And you can actually look up. You know, when you pass through the buildings, you can look up. And you can see the dialogue that's going on between the two sides of the project. That's it. Like I said, like, what we want to do with our project is to have the intent to be obvious. Um, the, the hand of the architect should be present. It should not feel like something just happened by accident. Um, so we wanted the idea, the purpose of the project, to dictate it and also to be strongly felt by its users. This is a project, um, it's a concept project we did for a client in BGC. It's for an SSS building. And the idea here really is about creating this kind of like hype. And if you look at the hype, you have all these uh, buzzing activity people going around it. <laughs> And in BGC, which is a new part of town, um, we don't have the typical Filipino um, context of having a piazza. So we wanted to introduce this idea of like a piazza surrounded by um, buzzing people going around. And we wanted it to be reflected also in the tower beside it. And so actually, if you look at it, um, it's all going around this small piazza, piazza thing. And each floor plate is actually different because we wanted a variance of users. So not all of the tenants would be the same. We wanted them to be different types of offices or users. Um, this is what the building will look like. So that's the that's the space you know going around the piazza. Down there. It's, we're trying to introduce, you know, um, an open circular plaza in this grid network and trying to see how the grid reacts to it, actually. And the focus is always on this public space on the ground plane, which we think we've extended to um, basically three tiers. So you have three tiers of public space. So that's the ground level. Another project we're doing in Cebu um, if you look at the city of Cebu, it's a very old city. 
one of the oldest cities in Manila, where the Spanish first came. Um, you know, it, it's it's kind of tied to this idea of the galleon tree. You know? um, so we thought that's the best, that's a good way of expressing um, Cebu, especially since you know our ancestors, you know, the, they came in. There's still still this boat building aspect that we have in the designs. Um, this is a space across Cebu in um, in Negros, actually, and. I was so interested in how they're still building boats there, and they're building without plans. Um, and it's, it almost feels like you know architects before, where you actually build a building without drafting. And so we wanted to figure out how we can actually detach the idea of drawings from architecture, and how we can make it about you know just the idea and the actual space. And so we talked with this like boat building heritage, you know, the history of the galleon trade, that. It's something you know that can be fitting to this project. It's a hotel project, and what we're trying to build is we're trying to build a hall. It's almost like a hall to contain travelers. Um, so the the concept is really about ocean voyages. So instead of like, and we like to do that and to have particular ideas, not just to have you know a, a hotel be about the water or the nature, but have it to be about something we do in the water, kind of like a lifestyle. So it's about traveling, you know, going on voyages and all that. So but the, the idea that we're pushing now currently is about social architecture. And what we mean by social architecture is we want to have architecture that creates relationships. You know, we want to build relationships not just between people, but between people and their neighborhoods, between people and buildings, and between the different buildings. So we wanted to connect things. And we think one of the things that connects all of us, you know, is you know intimacy. So we wanted to have this social intimacy, which we cannot have, we, which we cannot have, have with very monolithic institutions. So we wanted to break them down. We wanted to bring them closer. So you want the buildings or the library in this case to come to you and engage with you. You don't want to go visit the library. You want it to be there. It's like the change between having a software program in your desktop versus an app on your cell phone which is always accessible, it's intimate, it's yours. And so we built this project, um, it's called the Bookstop Project. Um, it's still in Plaza Roma right now, in front of Manila Cathedral. And so we thought like, you know, you might have libraries where you have nice reading spaces, like uh, the reading room here in the New York Public Library. Um, but you know, the best way to enjoy a book really is to read the book in the park. But the availability of these books, they're not always there. So we thought about you know, bringing books to the public, uh, making it open to everyone, and removing this stigma of you know, when you go to a library, you have to stay quiet, uh, don't make noise, don't bring food. Um, we wanted to fulfill you know, the agenda of what a library should be, which is to advocate or spread reading. You know? So we wanted to make books available for all, and to the people who need them the most. Because most of us here actually have access to good books. But the people who actually need books more than us are the people on the streets. And you know, they're not always prepared to go to a library. Because for you to be able to go to a library, you're expected to dress well. Uh, you're expected to have an ID for you to borrow something. You have to go through the strictest security guards, the most, you know, the most number of them. So there's a whole army of security guards preventing us from going to every place we need to go. And then the librarian always wants to keep quiet. So we said, you know, that's really too much work for you to get a book. So we wanted, we wanted to shorten this process. We wanted them to be accessible for everyone. And so we said, if we bring the books here, maybe people actually still like to read. They just don't have that access. You know? And it's not that libraries don't work. It's that the mode of delivery you know, or the platform of how we build our libraries no longer work. So we decided to build a bookstop project and we figured, uh, this is a video of it. Um, this is a video from CNN. So it's open to everyone. And one of the most amazing things is you can actually see the street children hanging around the library. And every minute you can get these street kids away from the street and spend time together with books, I think is a win for us. And you can see also the Filipino idea of helping out because you see the students sitting there um, reading to the street kids. And you can see that they are so happy to have some place where they actually belong and they're welcome. 
And the idea of something that is free and open for everyone is something so new to them because they're always being shooed away or being barred from everywhere. And so I think we really have to remove our, you know, all these barriers. And that architecture, well, ar architecture without walls actually could be so much more interesting. And so what they wanted to do is to create security and safety also with openness and sharing. Another project that we did was the Museo del Prado. Um, and it's the same thing, you know, we wanted to think about how we could make a museum um, open to everyone. And so this was an exhibit by the Instituto Cervantes and, and the Spanish Embassy. And so we thought it was a perfect opportunity for us to, you know, kind of like experiment with this. So instead of like building stands, you know, for painting, we said, why don't we try to recreate what the museum experience would be? Um, because anyway, what you need, you know, for a museum is actually the artwork to be there, a space that you can identify and people to enjoy it. So the museum, so the typical museum experience is you have these huge crowds of people going to a museum, um, trying to see every piece of art, doing a checklist and forgetting it the moment they leave. And you know, it's not really a good way to enjoy art, especially when you're just a tourist. And we thought that, you know, these spaces, they, they're, they're so intimidating that you're actually more interested sometimes in the space than the artwork. And well, like with the book stop, um, I think the same thing goes, you know, before you get into a museum, you have to go through a fence, you have to enter a gate, you have to pass security, you have to go to the lockers, you have to buy a ticket, you have to register, and then most likely than not, you get a guide. So, you know, just to enjoy a piece of art, you're spending about a good half an hour just for whatever. And, you know, people who have no connection to art, the people selling the vendors on the street, they have no experience at all with art. And if you want to have a creative economy, I think you have to insert this into the everyday lives of our people. And so what we thought was, again, um, it's just a piece of shelter that identifies it. Um, there's art that you want to view as a viewing area, and then there's the actual artwork. That's all you need, and it's a museum. And so we thought, why not put it in a public space like uh, Plaza de Roma, um, in Ayala Triangle, and you can actually get people to go there or pass through, you know, the people going there every day, passing through, going to work, and they see a piece of this art, and maybe you make your day a little bit richer. You know? And every day you have this um, engagement with art that you don't normally have. size replicas from the Museo del Prado in Madrid. Um, they're one is to one, they're actual scale, and they're high definition prints. And so the so it almost acts like a gateway, you know, like an introduction to museums and art. So you don't have to go out of your way, but if you enjoy this, then you can um, go visit the museum. And we've also realized that um, for you to be able to, you can, for, with these modules, you're able to recreate various experiences. You can create a corridor, uh, you can create a gallery, you can create a centerpiece. It's all a matter of like how you arrange the artwork rather than building walls. So without the aspect of walls, you're actually able to enjoy the art outdoors um, in an ideal lighting condition. And you know, it's much more intimate because you can just kind of like stay in front of one piece forever. And the people who go here really, um, a lot of them have never actually tried that to experience paintings or artwork. And that's the most important actually, to get into these people, to you know, um, get them interested, um, to introduce them into the richness of humanity.
this video was sourced from Filipinas Travel. I think that's something that we can do in Intramuros. I think it can be a rich place for culture. Um, it can be a center for culture for our country, actually. Um, this is a project that we're doing, exploring this idea of freedom of movement and actually um, social spaces. Um, we've been working with a client. Um, so the first project with them, we actually had this piazza in front of the, um, the shopping mall. And the piazza, we have the hall inside. And we had a basketball court inside also. And these are public spaces. These are social spaces that are private. And I think by introducing um, private spaces into uh, public spaces into the private realm, we create a richer experience. And so we turn, you know, our shopping malls into destinations uh, because they're more experiential. You don't because people are gonna stop shopping sometime. You know, and but we want them to go there not because they want to, you know, um, tour or something. We want them to go there because they want to see other people, they want to connect with other people, they want to belong to a place. And the second building is the same thing. Um, so what we did there on top of the piazzas, we did a playground outside for kids. And the next project we're doing with them actually is in Cavite, which is the typical suburban sprawl that we have. Um, so how do we deal with this? I think how we wanted to create, a, how do we create a shopping space for this type of development? Well, it's a private subdivision. Well, I'll be, I'll be the huge one. Um, so we said, what we can actually do here is we can just actually create space that can be adapted. And we wanted to try to figure out if we can do an open shopping mall, which is basically a market. Um, I think you know the idea of a shopping mall really derives from a market. It's just being a hyper retail experience market. And so I think we can bring it down to what a market is, which is a space where everyone can have a shop. You know, makers like you people, um, everyone can do their own thing and then offer their services or their things or their produce. I think that's really what the future marketplace should look like. I think the huge chains, you know, um, this is not something that's interesting. What's more interesting is how do we create uh, nice open spaces? And so we wanted to do a shopping mall that's open to everyone, that's forest on all sides. Um, it's in a safe, relatively safe environment, being inside the subdivision. And there are no walls, so everyone's kind of connected. And I think the ceiling, uh, it visually connects everyone. Um, so that's something that we wanted to do in this space. Um, another thing that we've been looking at is, you know, this whole idea of social architecture, you know, you can see it already. You can see it in effect right now. Because it's what the Catholic Church has done. It's what the government has done. So in the Philippines, I think, most of, more than anything else, you will see a chapel almost everywhere. You will find a chapel anywhere. You will find the barangay hall anywhere. And so the idea of like these institutions, you know, reaching out to people. And I think if it can be done by you know government and the church, which are the two largest institutions, we can do the same for art. You know, we can do the same for cultural institutions. And I think that's what we keep trying to adapt with our ideas for architecture, is how can we you know, um, engage more? And how can we, instead of building one huge monolithic cathedral, how we can have you know, small chapels that people can pray to every day, that we can engage. And one of the first ideas was like, we built this small, hosp uh, small hospital chapel uh, in Bambuhan. And this chapel, this is a small fishing village. And so on site, all you actually see are like uh, Nika structures. And so we thought, well, the most interesting thing here is just the materials actually, and maybe the geometry. And we thought there's really not much available industry, but we wanted it to be built on site uh, by the locals, largely because of the budget as well. And so it actually just kind of like took three people to build this. And we wanted to use, you know, the Nipa structure or the the Amakan, which they can source locally also. And since it's in a hospital, and it was a charity hospital, we wanted to have this like uh, colorful agenda because then we wanted to give like a cheer, you know, a cheerier face to the patients also and their relatives. 
and we actually had the stained glass done there also because there's just no way to bring a stained glass over. <coughs> and so it was just a, a simple roof geometry. We just decided that the most interesting thing in a Nipa hat is just the roof. And it's open on all sides. So instead of like covering the courtyard, um, what we did was this is a piece of shelter in there that everyone can access. So it's open on well, basically almost all sides. And it's very evident the moment you enter it that you would want to go and pray, actually. And so you extend this idea to the idea of um, a barangay hall, which you have everywhere. But the thing is, how we think we can improve, well, actually, all our barangay halls, they look the same. They all look bad. But what we wanted to do is we said, you know, if we can try to create a sense of familiarity, you know, we can make them uh, places of safety and security, which is what they are, you know. Uh, whenever there's domestic trouble, the first place you go and visit is the barangay, actually. And so I think we wanted to reinforce this idea of a place of safety and familiarity. And what we've done is we've tried to create a more modular uh, space. And so it's actually a module that comes in like three or dif some different sizes. Because we actually have very little space sometimes, and sometimes very large space. So it really changes per barangay. And so it's really just put together into these three different configurations. But the idea is you wanted a space that would kind of like act as a watchtower, eh? um, as a street light, you know, somewhere that's always lit, somewhere that's space, that, that's safe, uh, some place that's transparent because you don't want you know, it to be filled with whatever. Um, so it's transparent, it's open. I think government is best represented by transparency. And so the most immediate, you know, um, the most immediate connection we have with government should be that way. And then this is just a concept we're doing of how, like I said, how we can improve uh, space. And it goes beyond trying to revive a building. And what we try to see is how we create a community around here. So we've been able to identify this um, area or this district um, from the Met Theater all the way to, actually, you can walk all the way almost to um, Luneta. And we thought the only space that's a problem really is the park and ride thing, which is said if you could open that, you can actually create a whole promenade where you can walk from the front of the theater all the way to the city hall. And I think the city hall being such an iconic building in Manila should be open to the public. So we wanted to open the ground space there also. So if you open that, you can actually walk from Intramuros, you cross over to the post office, which hopefully could be a future hotel project, then you go to enjoy the Met Theater, and you can actually walk all the way to Ocean Park in Manila. And that's what we're trying to create. We're trying, we're, we want to remove the walls in the Mehan Garden, we want to open it up. I think having a guard, a walled-in garden serves no purpose at all, because public space should be public. And that's basically what we are trying to think about. And that's us. Thank you. WTA and what's special about each project. So we're, I'm opening the floor for question and answer. And the first five questions will get a context and intent book of uh, published. Yeah. Hi, I'm Cyrus from USD RT. And my question is how do you define Filipino architecture? Well, I've always defined Filipino architecture as something done by Filipino architects. It's as simple as that. Anything you guys do, anything we do is Filipino architecture. Um, anything built in the Philippines is Filipino architecture. I think to categorize things and to submit to a form of regionalism is not something we particularly do. So we just kind of like enjoy exploring architecture. And I would say anything done here is Filipino basically. So that's how we think about it. Thank you. So there was this girl here who raised her hand also before, after the Zoom. Hi, I'm Tix, Tix from Casabella. Um, my question is, how do you deal with security issues with your public projects? Especially, you know, knowing the discipline of Philippines. Actually, that's surprising. Um, you can go to the Bookstop project. It's right there in front of Manila Cathedral. It's five minutes away. Um, so if you walk there now, you'll see it's open. Um, it's open 24-7. Anyone can take a book. 
Um, I think people are, you know, inherently honest. <laughs> but I think we just trust in the good nature of people. And actually, we have ended up with more books than we started, actually. So people actually give more than they take. And so I think for some situations, it could work. And it would be amazing to actually explore that for some other things as, as well down the road. But yeah, you trust in people. Um, I think if the space is open, the more open it is actually sometimes, the safer it is. As long as it's open, it's more transparent, everyone can see what's going on. So by removing barriers, we're actually you know, inviting kind of like a social safety net. Because everyone's watching out for each other. You know? Thank you. So let's pick from this side the man. Okay. Here. Hello, good evening, sir. Um, I'd like to ask you about your residential building. Uh, before discussing it, you mentioned about having high fence, uh, high fences causes a crime. Um, like we don't have natural surveillance when we have this. So, what was your resolution to that problem, and how was that reflected in your uh, residential buildings that you've presented? Actually, the buildings that we did, the ground space is well. There's commercial space on the ground space, so there are shop fronts. If you're familiar with shop fronts, they tie into the streetscape. And so it just becomes part of the urban fabric then, um, so everyone can pass by. Um, I think the danger there is in fencing off everything. Um, but I don't really think danger is the, bigger, the biggest um, thing that we're trying to talk about, um, because most of them are pretty safe. What we're trying to address is this connection. You know, we wanted there to be better connectivity between the neighborhood. Because it cannot be a neighborhood if everyone's just, you know, um, fenced off from each other. So I think you, you want to build a community that way. Thank you. So let's have a person ask a question from this area, Naman. Okay, Sasko Good evening, sir. I'm Carlos from USD. And my question is, how do you contribute to the cultural life? cultural identity of the country through architecture or through organizing public spaces? Um, I, I think the distinct thing about architecture, it's the most evident representation of, you know, a society. You know, we can paint, uh, we can sing, we can dance, we can do all sorts of art, but the most, you know, the most visually evident, I think, uh, the, the one with the most presence is architecture. I was actually thinking recently about something like how, probably except for music, architecture affects the most people. Because music can have like a huge concert. So like simultaneously affecting a great number of people, only possibly architecture and music does that. And so I'm thinking like, you know, architecture is a good representation of who we are. And so what we do, what we build, you know, it actually shows where we're going also. Because what we're doing now will only become evident in five years time. And what, when they actually become functional and how they turn out, I think that's like 10, 20 years down the road. So that's why you know, we have to keep exploring and pushing forward. Because if we start looking back and just staying put or copying or being where we are, then there's no progression. Right? So I think we want to have visions of the future. And if we want to have good memories, we create you know, memories about the future. And that's really what we're kind of trying to find. Thank you. Okay, so last, is that the last book? Okay, so just out of curiosity, do you guys have a question for William T? Okay, this guy in the blazer. Hi, I'm Kevin from the University of Sydney. Uh, how are you going to build a community space with a touch of greens? Because some people are somewhat nagreklaman na because of they don't have green spaces already, and then at the same time it's not at all unit, especially in Metro Manila area. How we are gonna build? Sorry. How are you gonna build a green space in Metro Manila? Well, because buong Metro Manila is already compact and there's no green spaces already. I think, you know, the, the, the problem of open public space is a public, you know, it's a public sector problem. 
Um, it's something that's, that's why there are only some things that the public sector can address. But, you know, individually as architects, if we try to insert a touch of nature, you know, it doesn't even have to be greens, you know, um, just like, because nature can be open space also, you know, we can have a natural uh, relationship with the sky, you know, with a view, with anything else. Um, I think it's about having as much exposure, I think, is, is what I would say. You have as much exposure to the outdoors, you know, or to the public as you can. Um, but, yeah, so how we're also trying to address this, like with some of our uh, projects, is we're trying to insert the public space into our private development buildings. So I think we can start, as architects, we should do our most to convince, you know, uh, our clients how public space is an asset. It is actually an asset because if you think about it, when we build a shopping mall right now, you know, people, eh, shopping is going to go online someday. Um, but what they're trying to find is they're trying to find an experience. And the richest experience you can have, you know, is with your community. You know, so I think public space is something that can really be an attraction. And so it's something that we have to build towards. And, you know, as, as architects, um, I think we should know best, and if we advocate for it, I think it's something that can be figured out, you know. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, do, does anyone have another question? One last. Dito naman. Here you go. Hi, sir. Good evening. Well, I'm just late from the builders. My question is, since it's a project na po na high-rise condominium building, how did you come up to the idea of adopt, adopting the architectural style of the neighborhood instead of going for massive design? Because doing so, in my personal view, is being revivalism and only compromising the authenticity. Actually, one of the things that we really had to think about when we were doing that was that um, as you can see with most of our projects, we really do not have a stylistic um, tendency. Um, but in that case, we wanted to, well, one, we, I wanted to explore the idea of building an Art Deco building. I think it's an experience. Um, but also, I think when we were building that, I, I kind of saw this building near the site, which is the Vanilla Opera House. And I figured it could have been it could have been done better. And so I, I thought like, why not use this project to show how it could work? And so like I said, it's more about the purpose really than you know what what was what was gonna look like. It's really you know the purpose of that building or that project for us really is to send out this message that you know all these buildings there that people are turning into all sorts of things, that they can be better utilized. So that really was the pur purpose of it, or the point of it. Thank you. Thank you for your question and for your answer. So <laughs> let's give a round of applause for Sir William T. Jr. of WTA Architecture and Design Studio. Uh, please accept our, our token of the anthology. Uh, thank you.